Good morning, Highline. So um, my name is Lynn. I'm Speaker of the Caucus of Student Government. Um, I am also a member of MLK Committee. So today I would like to introduce our keynote speakers. Um, Jenna, Hencar Jenna Hencharts is a lifelong community storyteller who has been her career centering and amplifying diverse voice. Jenna is a leader of culture and innovator in Reveter, a women's run co-working and a community company poised to become a modern union of working women. Under equity equi and advocacy team, she builds unique membership programming and community partnerships centering DEI strategy. Jenna spent last decade of her career as a broadcast journalist in New York State, Kansas City, Missouri, and most recently in Seattle, Washington. She is a three-time Emmy Awards winner and Edward or Muro Award recipients. As a reporter and anchor, Jenna was responsible for cultivating, researching, managing, writing, and producing regional and national news stories. In Seattle, Jenna created a, um, the Emmy-nominated series Race and Parenting, which explores how families of different backgrounds talked about their kids, about race, racism, and identity. The series is currently being used as a tool for local school districts and the racial equity groups. Subsequently, Jenna created a follow-up series called Race and Sports, which was awarded a regional Emmy Award in 2019. Jenna grew up in Chicago and with a family roots in New York City. For the last four years, she's been soaking up in Seattle rain and scenic landscape of Pacific Northwest. Our keynote speaker today will be um, about courageous stories in the face of resistance. Please welcome Jenna Henchard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, can everyone hear me? I got this love mic on. You can? Okay, good. How's everyone doing this morning? Good. Good. That was good. Can we get just like a little bit more energy? How's everyone doing? I want to make sure she hears you. Is she good? Okay, good. She likes being up here. She starts kicking when she feels lots of energy from the crowd. So thank you so much. How many of y'all are getting credit for being here today? Some school credit. Okay, a good number of you. Lots of students. I like that. That's good. That's good. Well, thank you. I'll try to make this worth your time. And I appreciate Trinin. Uh, where'd you go? There you go. For, for, for the introduction and for having me and for Doris, thank you so much for having me and for the entire MLK committee here at Highline College. Thank you so much um, for having me here. All right, so I have got a question for you all. Have you ever heard a story so many times but you never really examined the fact that you're not in it? Have you ever gotten so used to being written out of a narrative that you don't even think twice about some of the most historic moments? So I never really question the day that we celebrate the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So I definitely have gotten a little bit tired, as I'm sure some of you have, of always hearing the same, I have a dream speech, like I'm sure that he said a few other things. But I've always been thankful, or I felt as if I've been expected to be thankful that we black people got a day on the calendar, a space to revel in the achievements of our past, examine our present, and activate our future. So let's take a moment to revisit the day that Dr. King delivered what many would consider his most quoted speech. Just gonna, let's see, there we go. All right, so this was that day. That day was August 28th, 1963. 250,000 people gathered at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And this is a photo from the agenda from that day. Famous civil rights activist and now U.S. Representative John Lewis spoke along with activist Whitney Youngs, you could see the full program there. And as most of us in this room know, you know who took the, took the stage that day. It was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He captured us that day. 
But what about this woman on the left? Anyone know who she is? Or this woman on the right? Does anyone know who she is? So that woman on the left, kind of giving Dr. King the side eye, that's Dorothy Height. And that woman on the right, that's Anna Arnold Hedgeman. So in 1963, Dorothy Height was the president of the National Council of Negro Women, and Anna Hedgeman was a staff member. They were both civil rights activists and leaders. Hedgeman was the only woman on the planning committee for the March on Washington. She used her ties with the National Council of Churches to bring white Protestants to participate in the march. Both Height and Hedgeman noticed that during the planning of the march that male civil rights leaders did not consider women as speakers or participants in the march on Washington. So there were women as musicians. There was even talk of having only the wives of the male civil rights leaders on stage, but no discussion about having black women having a voice at the table. So in 1963, Height and Hedgeman had the radical vision that women should be on the official program, the women who marched, the women who organized. So Hedgeman drafted a memorandum to the all-male group, noting, in light of the role of the Negro women in the struggle for freedom, and especially in light of the extra burden they have carried because of the castration of the Negro man in our, in our culture, it is incredible that no woman should appear as a speaker at the historic March on Washington meeting at the Lincoln Memorial. So in the end, you can see there right in the middle, the women got one slot as a group, a tribute to Negro women fighters for freedom. Merle Evers was supposed to speak. She's the wife of the late Megger Evers, but she couldn't make it, so it ended up being Daisy Bates. She was one of the nine students who integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. This is her. She ended up speaking on behalf of all women, and she said, in part, friends, the women of this country are pledged to you, to Martin Luther King, and all of you fighting for civil liberties, that we will join hands with you as women of this country. We will kneel in, we will sit in until we can eat in any corner of the United States. We will walk until we are free, until we can walk in any school and take our children to any school in the United States. And we will lie in, if necessary, until every Negro in America can vote. This we pledge to the women of America. So Daisy Bates reminds us here that women were there. They were on the front lines. They were arrested. They were physically and verbally harassed. They, too, faced the same dangers and threats as men, and they, too, put their lives on the line. But at the March on Washington, women didn't get a chance to walk with civil rights leaders, such as Martin Luther King Jr., who walked on Pennsylvania Avenue with the press linking arms with all only male civil rights leaders. Women leaders such as Dorothy Height and Rosa Parks, they marched actually on a different street, on Independence Avenue. At the end of the march, the men, the men they went on to meet with President Kennedy, and all the women were excluded. Coretta Scott King would later write about the march and her husband, saying, quote, it had been my great wish to march beside him, not from any desire to share the spotlight because I wanted the joy of being with him on this special day. However, it has been decided by the planning council that the march would be led by the top leadership, and of course, I had to accede, accede to their wishes. I must confess, though, that I felt that the involvement in the movement of some of the wives had been so extensive they should have been granted the privilege of marching with their husbands and of completely sharing the experience together as they had shared their dangers and their hardships. So let's think about this for a moment. One of the biggest moments in civil rights history barely had black women at the table. One of the biggest moments in civil rights history intentionally left out black women organizers and leaders. So the radical vision for the march that day may have been less about Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. The radical vision is that black women must be included in the fight for black freedom. That radical justice cannot be accomplished without gender justice. I've heard the story so many times that I never really examined the fact that I was not at the table, that my unborn daughter wouldn't have been at the table. 
I think we're taught as marginalized people to have gratitude, to be thankful for being in the room. And in my opinion, it's not enough to have a seat at the table. It's not enough to ask me to be at the table. If you want me at the table, then you have to want my voice too. You have to want all of me. I cannot be asked to separate my blackness from my gender identity. I cannot be asked to separate my gender identity from my race. For allies and for advocates, don't freeze up when I start speaking at the table. It's at the table where you will be tested. You may have fought to get me into the room. You may have convinced those in power to make space for me, but you're going to have to fight to keep me there when I open my mouth. That's what it means to be radical and righteous for those who feel hopeless and voiceless. So inclusion, it cannot wait. It cannot center whiteness. We cannot think about women tomorrow. We cannot think about queer justice tomorrow. We cannot think about refugees tomorrow. We cannot think about migrants tomorrow, because tomorrow is too late. Dr. King said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. So there's no time for apathy or for complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. So in our radical vision, we have to reclaim our past by re-examining our history. We have to rewrite our present by reevaluating inclusion. And we have to reimagine our future by centering voices that are absent and disrupting the structures that perpetuate the systematic failures that keep us out. So in many ways, I, I look up to Height and Hedgeman. I see myself in their stories, in their fight to not just be at the table, but to have a voice and to have some power at the table. There's a reason also why they say hindsight is 2020. And as I look back at the last decade of my experience as a journalist, I can now see what that fight for inclusion looked like for my story. So I stepped into my first newsroom at 16 years old at NBC News in Chicago. I was part of this six-year paid internship program through an organization called the Emma Bowen Foundation. And the goal of the foundation at the, at the time was to put more black and brown students within various news departments uh, in news media companies. The idea is that you would work at a major news corporation throughout college, and then after you graduated, the company would then offer you a job. So during my first week of the program, I was asked to bring a tape to the newsroom. And the moment I walked in, that's when I knew that's where I wanted to spend my time. People were talking fast and debating news ideas and talking with their hands, and I felt like this is actually a place where I could belong. This was me with Ann Curry. So my first summer I spent in Chicago, and my second summer I was in New York City at 30 Rockefeller Center at NBC News. Every morning there was a newsroom meeting, and everyone had a chance to throw out different ideas at the time, different ideas that they thought would be newsworthy. At the time, every senior producer in those meetings was white. And I remember sitting in the meeting and realizing and seeing the news stories, and I couldn't see myself in any single news story that they pitched. There was one black associate producer, and I pulled her aside and I said to her, I think I want to start pitching stories about black and brown people. No one else does. Maybe that will help get our stories out there. She said, no, absolutely not. You have to prove to them that you can tell their stories first. You don't want to be the reporter that only does black stories. Then that's all they'll think you can do, and then that's all you'll be. In that moment, I learned that whiteness was not only the language that I had to become fluent in, but within that corporate and capitalist and colonized space, there were levels. Those in power had the keys and authority to decide whether my black stories could be on TV. So at the time, I thought, OK, my parents are paying money for me to go to school. I got to get a degree. I want to be successful. I want to be the reporter at the White House one day asking the president questions. I want to be embedded with the troops on the front lines. So while I worked on my language skills, in the back of my mind, I also knew that if no one was bringing up our stories within the newsrooms of larger media companies, then who would? When would the stories that centered black and brown voices be part of the fabric of daily newscasts? But more importantly, would there come a day when I could muster up the courage in a room filled with people who didn't look like me to pitch the stories that matter and fight for them to be on air? Centering black and brown voices in corporate journalism companies has always been seen as a liability to profit. 
It would require newsrooms to step outside of often simplistic and damaging narratives that don't allow viewers to see black and brown people and stories and experiences as complex, but allows mostly white viewers to feel comfortable with the world as they know it. So following my internships, I went on to become an anchor and reporter in upstate New York for a couple of years. And after that, I was hired as an anchor and reporter in Kansas City, Missouri. And it was there that I really started to push the boundaries and understand the costs that came with speaking up. So I learned pretty early on in my career that in order to be heard and to advance, I had to center whiteness, men, white women, and heteronormativity. Over time, it became exhausting. In editorial meetings, I hemmed and hawed about speaking up. I constantly had to ask, ask myself, how do I keep my job? How do I excel at my job? And how do I be true to myself and my identity in spaces that weren't designed to include my voice? So a lot happened during my time in Kansas City. And one of the most memorable stories that I've ever covered was the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. The initial images haunted me. The first, a body lying in the street in a neighborhood just outside of St. Louis, Missouri. The second, a burned down gas station. The latter image was more unsettling because it symbolized the city being torn apart by rage, grief, and despair. Michael Brown's blood seeping into the asphalt on a street in his neighborhood was not only an image unfamiliar to blacks, or whites for that matter, in Ferguson, Missouri. What was unprecedented in Ferguson was a community that had come apart at the seams, crying for help, a revolt against their treatment and marginalization at the hands of police and local government. So at the time in 2014, my news director, she's the one that heads up the entire newsroom, she was skeptical, like many others, that the death of Michael Brown and the subsequent unrest was not a story of local coverage. Once I saw the burning gas station, I emailed my boss, no response. I called her. She said, no, Jenna, this is just another officer-involved shooting. We're not sending you. You can't go. She couldn't see beyond the black body. She couldn't see the bigger story that wasn't centered in her reality. So the next day, I decided to go to work early and meet my boss in the parking lot. It wasn't confrontational. It was just direct <laughs> and urgent. The moment she got into work, I had to tell her that these were the images that we've seen before. We saw it in 1992 in South Central LA, in 1968 in Chicago and Detroit. And if we're seeing it again, then we have reached another significant moment in our national history and our racial politics, a moment that must be captured by journalists. But it wasn't just my voice in her ear, it was the voice of white male allies white cisgender male allies who were in positions of power at the news station who were also saying it should be Jenna to go. It should be Jenna reporting on the ground. That as a company, we should spend the resources to send her with her microphone and her voice. So, it worked. My news director said yes, and at that point, I was in Ferguson, Missouri for two weeks gathering the stories that unraveled after the gas station burned down. But I also spent time trying to understand why news leadership struggled to give me the green light. I knew at that moment that newsrooms must be filled with journalists who are sensitive to the history and experiences of the people who live in these cities and the neighborhoods and the deep knowledge of those institutions and those who govern and regulate them. Furthermore, I knew that it just wasn't enough to be at the table, that I had to be heard. I had to have allies and advocates who were willing to meaningfully step into their allyship to amplify my voice to make institutional change. So in 2015, I arrived in the Pacific Northwest in Tacoma. I was hired to be the Tacoma Pierce County Bureau reporter at King 5. And it was last February 2018, Lori Matsukawa sent me a Facebook post by a mom in Redmond who was horrified by what happened to her two kids. Her 18-year-old and her 14-year-old were walking down the street, stopped to take pictures near a strip mall with cool retro lighting. They happened to be outside of a bar at a time, and a woman who worked at the bar came outside with a bat and told the two kids, the manager doesn't want N-words on the property. Now, she said the word, no abbreviation. The kids went home, told their parents, who then called the police, and the police arrested the woman. 
I pitched the story in my editorial meeting and you would have thought that it was Watergate. The questions, the scrutiny, and it's my belief that it was due diligence that would not have been applied if the kids were not black. They asked, what were the kids doing there? Do they have a criminal record? We should ask to look at the photos that we were, they were taking. And even if at 14 and 18, a brother and sister were criminals, does that make them deserving of racism? We went out to interview the entire family. The mother, of course, was shaken. The kids didn't understand what they did to be deserved being called the N-word, and their parents were left wondering if they had proper, properly prepared their children for a world that sees them as a threat. So I returned to the newsroom to pitch the story again. I argued that this isn't a story about this incident alone. I pitched that we examine the conversations that parents have with their children about race, racism, and identity. And at this point, I wasn't settling on any more two-minute news segments. I wanted my own table. I wanted four tables. I wanted to have this conversation over dinner and center the voices of the people there and put those conversations on the 11 o'clock news for the world to see. So this is what birthed the series that we called Race and Parenting. And I'm going to play you guys a clip from it. Can you guys hear it? I've been looking for an opportunity to have this discussion. Exactly. Today I'm bringing folks back to the table. We've got a camera here. A few finishing touches before we continue a discussion we started a few months ago. Hello, hello. In May, I invited 20 parents from different backgrounds to join me for dinner. I feel like if diversity was really a priority for my family, then I would do something about it. I wanted to examine the conversations parents have with their kids about race, racism, and identity. Right. It's like we have to explain that our, that our bodies matter. What goes into protecting kids, making them resilient? This is how you say my name. Don't mess with it. And proud to be who they are. And at home, we listen to a lot of music in Spanish. Four episodes aired on King 5. Black, white, Latino, and Asian families. <laughs> Today, two people from each episode are coming back. For the next hour, we'll bring you some of the highlights from those episodes. In the car, we were speaking Spanish, and then when we stop and we park, and say, okay, English here, okay? And then we're going to dig a little deeper. You may be trying to get through Thanksgiving dinner. Right, I'm exactly. trying to get through the next 70 years of life. Exactly. I'm bringing in Professor Rulina Joseph from the University of Washington to help us out. Oh, wow. My name is Jenna Hancher. I'm no expert. I'm just a curious journalist who hopes we can all learn from our experiences on race and parenting. So thank you all for coming. We finally made it here, so thank you so much for being here. Help us understand a little bit, while race is a, is a social construct, it, it's very much real, right, in terms of how we function and how we interact. So race is not something that we know is, is biological. It's something that was created hundreds of years ago to separate people, to divide people, to be able to exploit people, to enslave folks. Racism, the structure of racism, comes from these notions of race. Racism, of course, being the structures, the institutions that come from this discrimination. We think of racism as being something that might happen interpersonally, but that really can only happen when someone has institutional, structural power. We have these conversations because they're the experiences that we as adults are having, and we bring them home and talk and negotiate through them with our children. But they are the conversations that white families need to be having with their children as well. So for you all, when was the first time you realized that you needed to talk to your kids about race? I had a really good conversation recently. My daughter came home from school, and just kind of out of the blue, she said, like, we learned about slavery in, in school, and it made me really sad, mm -hmm. right? So it was, a, it was a great opening for a conversation and just kind of led to me asking more questions. What about for you, Beth? I mean, you're, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think out of necessity, it came probably earlier than maybe it would have had I had um, a white child. Friends at preschool would say, that's your mom, you know, when I would come and visit. Well, I mean, I remember a turning point for me in terms of how important I thought it was. Um, and that was when I watched for the first time the video of Eric Garner. Um, pleading for his life and saying, I can't breathe. Um, and it hit home for me, OK, this actually is happening. Um, and so I wanted to take more of an active role 
in addressing some of those issues through my work, but also with my kids. It's similar that my daughter was just wondered out of nowhere from the back seat of the car, um, why is it always on the news a white policeman shooting a black man? And she was maybe five at this. So thinking like my kid is not thinking this deeply at this point was. What about for you? He brought up the N word one time, and so just so I was. Able how did he? How did he bring that up? He, so that happened at school, and like I was like, okay. And when that happened at school, how did it happen? Like, did someone say it? Like, he what? had heard that that is just a bad, that's just a really bad word, and I was trying to contextualize it. How do you all feel when you get asked those questions? I mean, when they. I, I mean, I remember when I asked my parents like weird questions, they'd be like, oh boy, okay, now I gotta talk about it. You know, like, how do you all feel when you get, when your kid walks into your house and says, I heard the N word today? When they're bringing it up, I'm like, oh, let's go, let's go, and try to bring as many different resources and make them animated as much as I can. And so I, I, I'm fortunate, but again, I, I still wish like the school system would be doing, would be, would be practicing some of this as well. Looking at me? Yeah, we're all. I'm, okay. I'm looking at you. You don't have to say I anything. Oh, I am looking at you. <laughs> well, like you said, I think that episode was a good. It was a good start, right? Right. But I think if we were to go deeper, mm -hmm. and especially if you look at all the episodes together, it's just so clear that that racism is a white person's problem. Like it's like white people created this system, yeah. and, and all these groups of color have to do the parenting to to survive within the system, and so. We need to start having that conversation, or more white. Everybody's having the conversation, but more white people need to be having that conversation. That they need to be doing more to make sure your kid's not so exhausted. That you're not. Everybody else is not having to cater to white people's comfort. Right, so right. white people need to get more uncomfortable. Need to practice getting more uncomfortable, and yep. it's their job to help undo it. Mm -hmm. It's like we have to explain that our that our bodies matter. That our bodies have worth. That our bodies yeah. have have you know weight. Um, there's always this concept, and, and that. And that actually is what code switching gets to, right? Is it's it's to it's to really show, hey, I'm not one of those type of persons. Um, I am an expert. You're an expert. Yes, I'm an expert. Oh, wait, 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 let me do it. Let me do it. Let me show you. This is. I grew up in the uh, Pacific North North oh, yeah. Northwest. All of my yep. life. I mean, all of my life has. Has been been how do you how do you embody a, a black body in white spaces, mm -hmm. right? Especially in Seattle, how do I embody blackness in a sea of whiteness? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you do it? Yeah, it, it really is this method of what can I do to ensure that um, that I'm able to advance, mm -hmm. and how do I hang on to the fact that. Um, that I do like fried chicken, but I won't eat it in public. Right. Mm -hmm. That I do love watermelon, but I'm not going to eat it around you all. Right. <laughs> that right. I that I do enjoy these things, but no, 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 actually, no, I'm fine. Right. right? right. It's, 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 you know, how do you, it's right. a constant right. sacrifice, right? right? It is this constant um, struggle and tension that we have to live with just to, ex just to exist. I mean, and, and, and I actually tell, 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 uh, tell folks, I say, you know, I speak two languages, uh, uh, right. English, I am bilingual. <laughs> I speak English uh -huh. and I speak white. <laughs> you better put that now. That may not show up on a resume. <laughs> but but right, let's be. Qualifications but let's be real, in right? English and white. It is. Well, no, yeah. I mean, right. Um, that's a great point. Yeah, it's. Because it's a, a lot of what we do, I think, <laughs> as black. I mean, it's true. Are the things to make white people feel more comfortable oh, around it's us? It's about their safety. It's about their safety. If, if I threaten you, my life could be ended. Yes. If you feel unsafe as right. a white person, right? right? And that's that's a as a black man, I don't feel comfortable jogging down the street mm -hmm. and yeah. be better not put a hoodie on mm -hmm. and go yeah. jogging, mm -hmm. right? Like because if you're running, then you're you either did something wrong or yeah. you're about to go That's do true. something wrong, right? And do you think you'll have a conversation with your kids about that? With your two boys? I mean, because yeah, you have man. two black boys. Two black boys, go to the gym, son. Don't don't be running. <laughs> don't be running. Don't be running in the streets unless you got a ball in your hand. <laughs> and that's bad too, right? Yeah. Like, Okay. So. All right, I'm gonna pause it. I'm gonna pause it there, because it, it's about like uh, ten minutes, and, and I and I know we got a few more other clips. Okay, so after we did this, 
We realized that these tables led to more tables. Neighborhood watch groups, uh, they held watch parties for these episodes. School groups used the series to create a curriculum for parent equity groups. And it was these tables that forced us to really reconsider whose narrative was at the center of commercial television. It was these tables that allowed people to see themselves beyond 10 second sound bites that you usually see on the news. And after this, we created another series called Race and Sports, about how race, racism, and identity touched the lives of former coaches, um, former athletes, excuse me, coaches, and then fans. And I'll play you guys a clip from there. In this game, we don't run from it. We don't avoid the conversation. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. There are struggles that have shaped our history. A history that has said, you can't play here with us. Victories may lead us to believe that we have overcome. That we don't need to talk about it, but we do. That's what we're going to do, you heard. In many ways, these courts, these fields, have been a way to discuss more than just wins and losses. There's a new home trip in a long time, and it's hit the earth. So here on King 5, in a special presentation of race and sports, we'll nod to our past and embrace a real discussion of our present, of our future. Sometimes when we talk about race and sports, we talk about it just in the lens of kind of a Kaepernick kneeling or just in the lens of a Serena, but we don't talk about it on this level. When I think about sports, like, and I think I coach at a, I coach at an inner city school. Um, Cleveland is obviously predominantly African American, you know, mixed with a few Asian girls, and you know, I, I reflect back on games that we played against, let's say, a Seattle Prep or a Holy Names, and, and you're looking at the foul count, and, and Cleveland has, you know, 15 fouls in the first quarter, and the other team has three, and you stop to ask the referee, like, hey, you know, what are my girls doing? How do I make the adjustment? Your girls are the aggressor. So I remember the first time I heard that, I was thinking, like, dang, I got a whole bunch of inner city kids, some African American girls, and this is how you view my players as aggressors. Like, this is a basketball game. How, how would you even use that term, aggressor? Like, I was so offended. Would you think you were able to use that as a life lesson for them? Oh, life lesson, motivation. Because, you know, the thing is, is like, I try to tell my players that the sport, this is just preparing you for life. Race matters. It matters in everything. And if we say it doesn't, you're either naive or you're ignorant. How did you all break down those barriers of, of bias and, sure. and racism? I mean, I think, you know, I, I can remember there was uh, a teammate of mine who we are we are friend, good friends now. Um, our kids play against each other. Um, she is not a person of color, and she, you know, said something that was uh, offensive. It just came out of her mouth one day. We were stretching in practice, and she just said it. What she said? <laughs> I wouldn't say because then she'll know, and then you know everybody will know. But she don't know. You know. <laughs> she know. So, you know. She she made a comment about um, uh, the the odor that would come from just the black girls on the team, and we were stretching, and boy, I mean, it was like the you know the scratch the record, and everybody. <laughs> right. 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 Wait, wait, what? Wait, what you say? You know, and at that moment, there were you know. Uh, women of color who were clearly offended. I was one of them. There were, you know, white women who were offended. Like, hey, what are you, what are you doing? What are you, what are you talking about? And we could have, at that moment, just said, hey, we're good. You know, it took, a, it took us to both say, I'm not going to cut you out. I'm not going to shut off and just say that's what I think. And we're not going to ostracize her because really the numbers don't. For a basketball team, the numbers don't support that. You tend to compartmentalize it, right? Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. uh, because that's a safety, that's a place of where you can be safe. The locker room gives you that kind of safe space to kind of exercise some things out. Yeah. But it doesn't always go from the locker room to the sure. to the home. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, right. so you can you can have one way that you're operating in the locker room, and then it's a total code switch yeah. when yeah. you when you get out. When I walk into a football locker room, like usually it's separated by position. But it's also separated by race, too. 
you can just you can see the line right down the middle, white, black, and then everyone's just kind of doing a thing. When it's time to play, yeah, we come together and we have this one thing that we're that we're fighting for. But I've had to play beside dudes that have told me like, I don't want my sister to date a, a black guy, you know, stuff like that. But I have to play right beside this dude. So you get this kind of false sense of 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 uh, acceptance and understanding and security. But like, like, do they really know what makes you cry? Do they, do, do they know what color can you, you like? Can you even cry? Yeah, exactly. Can you even cry? Like, can you even talk about the trauma? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can they even understand the trauma and how that impacts you and how, right. how it, it, it makes you who you are? Like, do they really know that? Or do they just know me good enough or well enough to be like, hey, let's go do this. Yeah. And we'll, we'll whatever is between us, don't it? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. If, if sports is going to impact a person in a way that it totally changes them, then they have to also do a lot of work around uh, their perceptions of things out, outside of sports. Sure. Right. I mean, I guess. All right. Thank you all for letting me share that with you. So that was in 2019 that we aired those. They were four different episodes. Um, each one were four, and then we aired a, um, an entire hour series. So after they aired in 2019, I was told there would be no more space for my tables at King Five. Then I'd have to return to the two-minute news script. And a couple of weeks later, we won an Emmy Award for the series, for the Race and Sports series. Thank you. And then one month later, I quit. I wish I could say that allyship and advocacy stepped in to fight for my voice, but that didn't happen. I realized that I actually had to bet on myself. I had to bet on me more than I bet on any institution believing in me. I had to have a radical vision for myself in 2020. I had to find new tables to build, explore different ways to tell stories, and take the risk of being outside the boxes that I'd been in for the last 10 years. And I'm still writing that story. For those here, whether you're a student, a young and seasoned professional, you will be challenged. Marginalized people, you will have to figure out how to dance, the push and pull of how you can be truthful to yourself and still be within these spaces. Allies and advocates, you will have to step up and see where you can step in to amplify and center marginalized narratives. Before I leave you, I want to go back to that day, the March on Washington. 1963. I wish I could tell you that it was Dr. King who pushed for women to speak on the stage that day, or John Lewis, or Whitney Young. It's historians, too, as well, who have often left out the contributions of women that day. Anna Hedgeman would later write about that day, and she said about Dr. Martin Luther King, your dream of a new frontier is bound up in the dreams of all men who have had a vision beyond the moment, a vision of some men in the world from the beginning of time. Martin Luther King standing in front of 250,000 people in the face of all the men and women of the past, I wished very much that Martin had said that we have a dream. In my opinion, Hedgeman is saying, it's not about you, it's about us. It's about the collective. It's about everyone's dream for equity, for a voice. I don't tell you this to discredit King or anyone else's contribution to the movement. I tell you this to challenge your views of the stories that have been told to you, how they've been told to you, who brought them to you. Inclusion must be intentional. And it is the fight for the inclusion that must be courageous even in the face of resistance. Thank you all very much for your time. <laughs>